Welcome to A Thousand and One Ways to Cope with Stress. I am Professor Kinshasa Shabaka, and we are delighted with the return of Dr. Frederick Munderson, our Egyptologist, our historian, to present us with a series, four parts on the famous Luxor Temple. We welcome you, Dr. And I want you to know that for today's presentation, I did a symbolic representation of the Nile. We have here the blue marbles for the water. We have this flower, which represents the lotus, which I always associate with Egypt. And of course, we drink the luxury, the beauty, the aesthetics, and the history of the Temple of Luxor. We welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Professor. Thank you for having me. It's interesting that how unconsciously we communicate psychically because I chose a blue shirt and it's so well within the, the format that you have chosen. And we are really investigating an important piece of uh, creativity. The Temple of Luxor. Uh, the Temple of Luxor is, uh, is, is a wonderful creation that is dedicated to the spiritual consciousness of man. And as such, there is an admonition to begin with, man, know thyself, for the cosmos is incarnate in you. The first thing I like to do is I created this poem to the temple, where I went to the temple and I spoke to the temple. Uh, sort of talking about the temple itself to the temple, if you know what I mean. Mm, I uh, it, it goes like this. Uh, Amenhotep III, mighty bull, shining in truth, erected the temple of Luxor for his father, Amun-Ra, the lord of diadems. This sudden is suit, resting on three axes and made of fine white sandstone with walls of electrum and floor of silver, is a favorite and joyous place for the sovereign of life, health, and strength. Amun, the beautiful bull of the cycle of the gods and lord of the upper and lower world, the ancient of heaven, chief creator of the whole earth, and lord of all existence, he left his throne of thunder, Karnak, to visit Luxor. Amid exuberant fanfare of the lord of high crowned plumes, Lord of Adoration, journeyed to the sudden Isut, Luxor Temple, for the open festival of joy and festivity. Amun is the sole and the only God, the only one, the Helopotlitian, presiding in his harem. The most glorious, Lord of Eternity, mighty lover of power, whose alter ego is, is Itifilic Min, is satisfied with his son, who is vigilant. To seek that which is useful. Amenhote, the golden Horus, great in strength, good God, rule of Thebes, is lord of strength and mighty of valor. This magnificent monarch, praise the maker of all beings, giver of life, doer of justice. Amun, bull, beautiful face, creative animals, worship here is lord of divine grain. Even the gods bow themselves before the mighty majesty of Amun, and extol their creator. They exalt when they approach him who begat them. Master of the land of the south, these gods love their savor when he comes from the land of Put, being rich in sweet scents, returning from the land of the Matau, God's land. The Lord of life, prince of the Jew, judge of the combatants in the great hall, beloved one of the Alps, is pleased with his house of life. Indeed, a majestic view that reminds of a splendid age is Luxor Temple in the approach from Karnak to the north. In the court of Nectanebo stand obelisks with hieroglyphic inscriptions and seated and standing statues of Ramses II. Some say vainglorious, others the great. Ramses inscribed the Battle of Kadesh on the exterior of your walls, of your, of, of your pylon great temple. In profound symbolist significance, the struggles between good and evil, light and darkness, struggles between 
Good and evil, light and dark, instructs the entrance into your sanctuary. Conquer the inner self before entering the holy place where the gods adore our moon majesty, for he is living in truth every day. The Ramesian front, oriented towards Karnak, rests on a subsidiary axis. It is different from the secondary processional colonnade and principal axis of your original temple. Ramses' recognition that Amun's beauty captivates the heart. He is the form one, creator of everything that is, only one, creative things that shall be. Men and women proceed from his two eyes, a skipper in his boat who give the order. The gods came into being, and these gods say, welcome in peace. A skipper, this great god, this age one, perception is his in his heart and command is his lips. His soul is shoe and his heart is definite. These were earlier gods that were created in the beginning. Uh, son and grandson uh, of the original creation process. His eye, right eye is the day, his left eye the night, and the faith and the harvest gods are with him for all people. Entrancing the pylon into your great court, visitors encumber the double inward colonnaded peristyle. This is called, this is where Ramses II added to the original temple. It is called the Ramesian front because it fronts the temple and it was added by Ramses. To the right, Hatshepsut of shrine to the Theban triad. The Theban triad is Amun, his wife Moon. Amun is the sun god, his wife Moon is the earth goddess, and their son Khonsu is the moon god was usurped by Thutmose II. Hatshepsut built this kiosk, a chapel, to these dedicated to these three gods. And it takes us back because this was generally built before the Temple of Luxor. So what it intimates is that there is there was an earlier temple that Amenhote dismantled to construct his masterpiece. Then Ramses, uh, uh, to the left rests the mosque of uh, Abu el Haggab. He is a patron saint of Luxor who came from Syria to preach Islam in the Middle Ages. And uh, it's interesting how his temple is located relative to the temple of Luxor. Inward to the left, striding statues of Ramses stand between the columns. Inward to the right, Seated statues of Ramses, the, he's the son of the rulers. He was, some have called him a megalomaniac. Okay. The straddle of central axis on the pylon, on the exterior pylon, he looks eastward to the rising sun, the board of life. And he also looks westward to the waning sun, which is the sun of rest and recuperation to emerge again on the horizon on the next day. Nearby the southwest wall anciently depicts the plan of Luxor Temple. This is interesting and we'll come back to it. Showing Ramsey's son and priests with fat cows in procession to the temple. It's a, an illustration that is unique in, in all representations of uh, the, the temple uh, uh, decoration. An illustration depicts a Nubian lady, the goddess Hathor coming out of a, a cow's head. And uh, I argue that there is, one has to wonder why would Ramses place, who was very versed in the knowledge of the history of not simply this temple, but the whole Pharaonic experience, why would he put this Nubian lady in this position going to the temple? And it, 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 it questions the whole set of arguments as to who, in fact, the original Egyptians were. So it's rather controversial. And the interesting thing is that uh, you can't find that particular image in books. And even, uh, even the, uh, the guides, they go, and I was there last year with my wife, and, and we sat down and we looked at this. They go to the wall, and they point to the image of the temple and the procession, but no one ever says anything about the role of this woman, this African Nubian woman. 
In this sacred place, the chief of the laps, lord of the Ewer crown with lofty plumes, whose diadems of beautiful white crown is high, gods, kings, and men worship in adoration. Beyond this court stands the processional colonnade of Amenhote III, architectural splendor of Kemet. It is a fitting testament to the Lord of the evening and the morning barks, the resplendent one in the house of the Ben Ben, who traverses the heavenly peace. Decorated by Tutankhamun in your mighty Ammonian restoration, the western wall on your processional colony depicts the open voyage to Karnak. The eastern wall equally recounts the return to Karnak, the, the open voyage to Luxor, and the eastern wall recounts the return voyage to Karnak, where the procession originally uh, uh, began. Where drama, solemnity, fanfare, frolic, and feats are vividly portrayed. The sovereign on his throne loved and revered reigns high as in the heavens, broad as in the earth, deep as in the sea, blue as in the Nile, as your, as your <laughs> illustration indicates. Glory to thee, says every wild creature. Praise to thee, says every desert. Awe and reverence for the Lord of terror, creator of existences, who made mankind and created the beasts. It is he who makes pastures for the herbs and fruit trees for men, who creates that whereby the fish live in the river and the birds under the heavens. As Lord of the gods, the Nile comes at his will. Your blue represents the Nile, of course. He, the sweet, well-loved, maker of all the herbage that sustains all cattle and give warmth, life to all beautiful beasts. He is the creator of pasturage, wherein herbs and flocks live, and the staff of life of mankind. He makes life the fish in the river and the geese in the feathered fowl of the sky. And when he comes, mankind lives. He is the Lord of grain who makes sustenance for the wild beasts of the wilderness. Your court of Amenhotep III highlights the original temple that challenges description, a testament to the magnificence of its builder and greater glory of the Lord of sacrifices, the bull of offerings. Here, a double row of 12 east and west columns stand perpendicular to a double row of eight split by a central aisle. In praise of the God with many names without number, atop a base, papyrus columns with triple bands and closed bud support an abacus and mighty architrave. Any of these architraves weigh 20 tons, so you talk about and how these people are able to erect this without without pulleys uh, on this high plateau is, is amazing. Play of light and shade fascinates photographers who flock here to imagine your august majesty amidst Amun's approval. He is a hawk, divine, with outstretched wings, speed one who carries away his assailant to the completion of an instant. A majestic hyperstyle with four rows of eight columns is split by the central aisle. Original and later bark sanctuaries of Khans and bark sanctuary of Mut surround an inner hyperstyle hall that occupying Roman legions modified as their chapel, recognizing that men issue from Amun's eyes and from his mouth gods came into being. These gods rejoice over the beauty of the Lord of joy, mighty in his appearances. In majestic in majesty, a hall of four columns stand before while three compartments with three columns each front private apartments that enclose your sanctuary for the bark of Amun. To the rear rest, the sanctuary of Amenhotep III with two rows of six columns, a small room with four columns and two rooms with two columns each comprise the inner compartment service, giving service to Amun as men in the southern harem. What a wonderful testament to the Lord of Lords, who fashioned himself, whose name is high and mighty and powerful. There is none that was made without him, the great God, the life of the Enid. So in essence, I, I made this, it's original mm -hmm. thought that I was able to coalesce from my researches. And I, I wrote this poem. In fact, I wrote a whole series of poems to different gods and temples. Uh, I, I, I respect to the gods, I, I, I made the poem in adoration or praise and adoration, but in respect to the temples, I actually visited the temple and spoke to the temple in writing this poem. So this is a, actually a, a tremendously original 
piece of work. Now, Laksa is uh, is is unique in many respects. Uh, it is um, it is a manifestation of man bringing God to reside in his presence, and in that, it is adoration of God operating in man. So the two goes together. Now. Uh, today, the modern town surrounds Luxor from the northwest. In the play of afternoon sunshade, a spectacular view is afforded uh, from the northwest between the gates. Oh, Grand Lodge, fount of knowledge and inspiration, house of life, manifesting divine essence in geometry, intellectuality, and spirituality, radiate as of old when Africans instructed and enlightened the world. Come to you that great ancient reverence, strengthen and protect your people that they may do good in the world to improve the lot of humanity. So we're asking, we're asking all practice within the philosophic construct of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. So this whole idea is, is somewhat akin to what uh, Milana Kareng, he was the, the, the creator of, of, uh, of Kwanzaa, uh, has said that people should, uh, seek to bring good into the world. Now, can you imagine that if six billion people on the face of the planet, on a daily basis, sought to bring good into the world? How different uh, it would be. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> imagine, yeah. So, nevertheless, so in reflection, we realized that there were two principal builders of this temple. Uh, Amenhotep III and Ramses II. But if we include Hatshepsut, whose temple had predated this, then there are actually three of them. So what do we have in terms of the makeup of the temple? Okay, so you have the temple, pro uh, you know, the interesting thing is the God looks out to bless and admire his creations. And the visitor, or the 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 the, the the kings, whomever, that are uh, in practicing the rituals, look in to worship and adore, right? So we are often confused as to uh, how should the temple be numbered, going in or coming out. But if you look at how the temple is built, it is built in from, from the inner por portions outwardly. Right? So we have the temple proper, which is the covered temple with a roof. This, we're talking about Luxor, of course. Right? Uh, that is from the sanctuary to the outer columns of the hypostyle hall. Altogether, this consists of 109 columns make up this location. And then we have the second part will be the, the court of uh, uh, Abenhotep III, which I described in the poem. Right? It is a square peristyle. It is a bit wider than the original uh, hypostyle hall. Uh, 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 it has three faces, an east face, a west face, and uh, a northern face. And the, the northern face of the hypostyle represents the fourth face, which you would probably say would be the southern portion of the court. In this court, there are six to four columns arranged in two double rows of 12 each, which would be 48, and two rows of eight split by the central axis. So you move it from the inner portion of the, of the, of, of the, of the, of the temple, from the sanctuary to the uh, hypostyle hall that has, that has a roof. The court is roofless. It is an open court where the sun uh, does its wonders. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, the, 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 the temple is so arranged that the, the sun crosses in an east-west fashion. And in the afternoon, after the sun has, uh, has transmitted, it transposed itself, uh, the western colony gets the back reflection of the sun and it becomes what is called a photographer's paradise because everyone, there is, there is a play of light and shade on the temple, this particular location that all the photographers find this as a paradise. Mm -hmm. 
that is two rows of 12 each and eight. And these latter, uh, they split the center line. And then we have the powerful uh, processional colonnade, which consists of two rows of seven each. Now, this is an interesting addition to the temple. And it, in fact, it is the end of the original temple. But it's interesting because this king, uh, James Brassett, who was the earliest American Egyptologist, one of the most popular, he had said that he began this uh, form of architecture in, in Nubia as a, 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 a trial location. You know, Professor Clark liked to say that John Henry Clark, of course, that um, the, 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 the whole notion of the Egyptian culture was rehearsed in Ethiopia, in Central Africa, as a, play, a screenplay would. And then it was, it was transposed down the Nile to the stage. He's using theatric language, you know. So what Brester said is that Amenhote first experimented with the colonnade, the processional colonnade in Nubia, and then he erected two of them, one at Luxor and one at Karnak. The one at Luxor has seven, two rows of seven. The one at Karnak has two rows of six. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I really couldn't tell you. I wouldn't couldn't tell you. I, I can tell you that they're both majestic creations. And of course, uh, they're uh, in excess of almost 70, 70 feet high. And they have um, open, open uh, lotus uh, capitals. And uh, all of the, the columns are, are basically uh, inscribed principally with the king's name, the king's cartouche, and what have you. But the, the difference between these two is that Luxor has two rows of seven, while Karnak has two rows of six. Uh, so the temple up to the processional colonnade was complete by the time of Amenhotep III, but it was not complete in the true sense. So uh, they, there was uh, his son, uh, Amenhotep IV, who led the, the Amarna revolution. You know, uh, scholars like to say uh, it, that he was a heretic, but uh, as Dr. Benda has pointed out, this term heretic, was invented 2,000 years later in the, uh, in the Reformation. So it really can't apply to this man. He was a revolutionary. So you can, instead of calling him an, a heretic, you would say that Amenhote IV, Ignatin, was a revolutionary. So the Amarna Revolution, uh, he wanted to move from one god to the other. He wanted to get rid of Amun and, and, and institute his god, Aten. So he, in many respects, attacked the temple. Uh, he sought to erase the, the image of Amen. Uh, uh, and even his father's name, which was Amen Hote, he erased that portion of his father's name so that the father's name simply became Hotep as opposed to Amen Hotep. Uh, well, after he attacked the temple, uh, he was succeeded by Tutankhamun, who did some restoration, and he completed this temple. And then he, he created the, the illustration that depicts the Opet Festival. And as I said in the beginning, the Opet Festival is the festival in which they, for which the temple was actually born created. And that is to say that at a certain time of the year, the god would leave Karnak Temple, his principal residence, and with his wife, and sail down to uh, sail to um, Luxor, and remain in accoutrement with his fiance, his wife, his, his better half, for 24 days, and then there would be his, his celebrants would uh, enjoy uh, fanfare, festivity, and all kinds of um, joyous activities while they were there. And at the end of this 24-day period, they would return back to, to, to Karnak. And all of that is illustrated. 
and this is what uh, Tutankhamun's contribution was. And then comes the, 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 the 19th dynasty, uh, in which several pharaohs uh, would leave their imprint on the temple, uh, and chief of which would be uh, Ramses II, because he created what is called the, the, addition of, the additional court called the Ramesian front, because it was the front of the temple, and it was added by Ramses, so it was called the Ramesian front. And this is the one in which the, 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 the statues were seen as if coming out from between the columns, which was, which was a totally unique experience. And in addition to that, uh, he created the great pylon that walled the court. Okay, that is to say, uh, he now created what is called a peristyle court. Right, a peristyle is different to a hypostyle hall. A hypostyle hall is a, a room of columns with a roof. A peristyle court is a roofless uh, 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 arrangement of columns in a pattern. So uh, uh, he did that, and he illustrated the great pylon and what have you. But in addition to that, in addition to that, uh, um, what we found is that it is argued that every century, a century, when before they build the high dam and the low dam or whatever, with the inundation of the Nile and so forth, that the land rose. So over a period of time, when the temples were abandoned and, uh, and the land was inundated with the Nile overflow, the land built up so that in the, 19, in the Middle Ages, when they came to build the temple of the, 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 uh, the mosque of 